Uh, next, Representative Kuhl <coughs> moves House File 3308 to be laid over. Uh, I will move House File 3308 to be laid over. Uh, Representative Keel has an author's amendment. I will move the A5 amendment. Representative Keel to the A5 amendment. Sorry, it's a little bigger bill. <laughs> got to make sure I got my stuff um, organized. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mr. Chair and members. Um, the uh, author's amendment uh, does a few things. First of all, asks that the uh, information um, of the housing with services is, uh, is posted so that um, when you're going into a residence that you know who owns who is running the facility, but also who is backing the facility if it is a, a larger business. Uh, I, I think of Good Samaritan in my district. Um, I have a, a couple of them and then their, their home office so that um, residents know who to uh, approach and who to uh, uh, send their concerns or hopefully their best wishes on how well they're doing. Um, and that's part of the bill. And the other part is to add <coughs> some members to the working group. Uh, as you'll notice, I wanted to make sure that, um, that we represented all of Minnesota, uh, that we had rural and metro. Uh, I've had the privilege of visiting a number of facilities in Minnesota and uh, notice the difference and the size um, that we deal with when we have these different facilities. So um, I wanted to be able to see things like um, uh, area of aging uh, council, both uh, metropolitan and rural, um, added legislators to the working group, um, also the Minnesota Council on Disabilities, uh, very concerned that we have, I want to point out too that we want to remember that this is uh, vulnerable adults from 18 to end of life. So um, tried to uh, uh, look, seek uh, people that have input that are in all different walks of life. Um, and then also uh, on uh, uh, the section two, added some um, more requirements for the working group that they have to, the duties that they need to do, uh, making sure that they review the building design and the physical environment dietary services, support services in general. We want to remember that um, unlike nursing homes, these are two different subjects. The, the building itself and the services are often two different things and uh, to, or could, can be provided by two different services or can be provided by the business itself. Um, so uh, that's important. Um, also um, wanted to make sure that uh, uh, that they have that conversation about uh, electronic monitoring. I know that there's been a working group on that already, but I think we need to talk about where that goes and uh, with the uh, stakeholders, uh, the residents that are going to be dealing with whether or not they want recordings in their rooms, uh, in their building in general. Um, and uh, let's see. Wanted to make sure that we have people that are in, uh, involved in dementia, Alzheimer's, um, also, uh, like I said before, rural, urban, and then the uh, last one is, um, uh, let's see, just making sure the working groups are, are of uh, multiple uh, areas. And then uh, um, there's a fiscal note. I want you to note that we did not, in the fiscal note, this did not include I added um, um, uh, five additional regional ombudsmen to this um, uh, this bill, and that is not in the fiscal note. So that was uh, not included. So that would be the amendment. All right. Thank you, Representative Keel. Uh, discussion to the A5 amendment. Representative Loeffler. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Representative Keel. On the, the first part of the amendment on page one on the information required to be, be posted, mm -hmm. um, it's all mail address, mailing addresses. Uh, there's no phone contact, email, um, even for the, the site on site manager. Um, when we have heard these really disturbing stories, people don't want to sit down and write a letter. 
Um, they want to be able to get a hold of someone instantaneously who is responsible to make sure that they're informed of the situation, to make sure that they're um, aware of the, the concerns and the worries. Um, and I would really strongly suggest that we move beyond a mailing address to actual phone, email, and mailing. Um, I think in most cities that require licensing of rental properties, they require that kind of information from the landlords, even if you're just renting you know, a duplex or an apartment building. And for sure, this should be as easily accessible in terms of being able to know who's in charge and who to complain to, even if it's just the smoke detectors aren't working. I mean, though, there's, there may be safety issues that they need to get addressed, that, that need to, they need to have someone accessible um, in an easy communication pattern. Okay. Representative um, Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Loeffler. I, I, I would agree with you. I think that's something that we can uh, attach to that. Uh, I don't know if we can do an oral amendment to say, We'll just do it later on. Okay, thank you. All right, Representative Liebling. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Keel, I'm glad to see this uh, attempt here to do this because that's something I was asking about because of what the OLA said. But I just want to ask you, is there any teeth to the requirement here? I, because we just have it as an amendment, I don't really know how it fits into the overall law and I don't know if there's anything that you know what if they don't is there what's the enforcement of it representative um, I guess I would expect that they would follow the law just as many of the other statutes that are already in 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 law are supposed to be there is no teeth in this portion however there is in other parts okay so mr. chair representative Lee. so representative Keel so this this Require, it says information required to be posted. This is um, pretty basic stuff. So, because we had talked about this before in other committees, so somebody who's actually living in one of these facilities needs to know who owns it, who mm -hmm. they can go to. Mm -hmm. And and yet, mm -hmm. right now, we know from the OLA itself that a lot of the facilities, it's really hard to figure that out. So, just because we're saying it in a statute, if there's no, re you know, it says required, but you're not aware that there's any penalty or anything? What do you do if it isn't, if they don't post it in your facility? Representative Keel. Mr. Chair, Representative Liebling, it is part of the survey. So they have, when, when they're surveyed, that has to be checked. Um, and, and I, uh, maybe Christine, would you like to? Um, Part of the enforcement that you can put into place is making it part of the home care survey requirements. No, no different than having your license posted. Okay. All right, thanks, Mr. Chair. All right, other questions on the A5 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of adoption of the A5 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The A5 amendment is adopted. All those in amendments. All right. Uh, perhaps it would uh, make sense for uh, Representative Keel to just uh, brief walk through for the bill uh, the sections or the pertinent sections that you might think, and then uh, we have several DFL amendments that we'll go through after that. If that would be helpful for members, just to kind of get clued into the bill. Okay, Mr. Chair. Um, House File 3308 um, actually is addresses some of the OLA, uh, uh, most of the OLA re report. And uh, first of all, I want to uh, point out that, you know, after hearing these heartbreaking stories of abuse, neglect, maltreatment, um, brought forward by the media and the committees, um, we work toward waiting for it, we're hearing the le uh, legislative auditor's report, and then uh, d addressed the uh, improvements that need to need to be uh, uh, taken care of by the Office of Health Facility Complaints. So this bill is really intended to provide transparency, accountability, and uh, 
uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to prevent um, maltreatment for our most vulnerable adults in Minnesota. <coughs> House file 3308 as amended will take steps to protect a vulnerable adults. Um, one of the important things that are in this bill are the working groups. And I know everyone looks at that and says, oh, we're not handling it. But this is a very complicated, terribly um, intensive uh, uh, concerns that we need to take care of for our, our uh, vulnerable adults. Whether we've got someone in a nursing home, assisted living, housing with services, um, there's just a multitude of different ways that uh, people are choosing to live. And, um, you know, um, we've gone from having a lot of people living in nursing homes to a, the, the bigger choice is assisted living. And I will readily admit, um, having uh, helped my in-laws move in in 1998, assisted livings have changed tremendously in that time frame. And um, we need to make sure that um, we bring those changes along. I, I think of when I visit that same assisted living now, the residents there have different needs and uh, stay longer when they do have some challenging needs. And I think in defense of uh, um, housing with services, assisted living, we need to also identify within that working group, you know, what, what are the lines? The Office of Health Facility Complaints, when the OLA looked at them, said, you know, they didn't have clear direction. I think we need to take that time in working groups to be able to um, identify all the needs, hear from uh, a lot of different groups within Minnesota, both rural and metro, to be able to identify what, what needs to happen or what, what we need to address and how we handle that. Um, uh, the, uh, the bill takes, takes to heart the OLA's reports. We will create two new panels within the Office of Health Facility Complaints. Um, and really, that is the most important thing, that we make sure that the Office of Health Facility Complaints does their job, collects and applies the data, which will help us to decide exactly where we need to address it. I've asked the department. Um, we don't have um, Department of Human Services for data. We don't have all the breakdowns. We don't know. I have numbers from 2017. It shows that not quite half of the complaints, a huge amount, not all were substantiated, um, are 64 and under, the age of 64 and under. So it's something that we need to see the data to address and know what we, are, what, what we need to be doing here. We've heard a lot of awful stories, um, just really sad, and um, they need to be handled. So. With um, the uh, panels, the requirements for the o o OHFC, that is so hard to say all the time, Office of Health Facility Complaints, and making sure that when a complaint is, is uh, filed that it is actually addressed and handled in a very precise and urgent manner so that those that are substantiated are handled within hours, days of when it happens. With me. I have Christine um, here and would like to. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Baki. Please introduce yourself and uh, proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm Christine Baki. I am the CEO and administrator at Madonna Living Community in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, we are part of the Benedictine Health System, which is a not-for-profit organization that has served seniors not only in the state of Minnesota, but in North Dakota, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Missouri. We are in Rochester, we serve about 600 seniors per year in a continuum of care um, in three campuses. So we provide skilled nursing care, we provide memory care assisted living, the traditional assisted living and independent housing. I have been an administrator for 21 years, um, but before that I was a caregiver. I had a grandmother who was in a nursing home for 13 years um, as a young child, I spent lots of times in nursing homes helping my grandmother um, and was fortunate enough when she finally passed away to be with her um, and, and watch the caregivers come and support the family um, through the end of my grandmother's life. And it was in those moments that I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to help as many people as I could have the experience that my grandmother had 
which was significant love and support. And our family had that as well. The stories you're going to hear tonight, they're horrific. I, I can't even imagine the range of feelings that these families and, and the residents um, have gone through with these experiences. And there is no excuse. There is absolutely no excuse that anyone should have to tell these stories. But it's not the only story out there. We have thousands, hundreds of thousands of people served in Minnesota over the years that have had exceptional experiences in all of these settings that have not experienced these situations. AARP has ranked Minnesota as number one and number two in our nation over many years for the care that we provide seniors and the range of options that we provide them. So we have a system that does function at a very high level across our country. Every day, providers work to ensure that we give high quality, person-centered care. You have heard this over and over, not just tonight, but over the years as well, that workforce has become a very strong issue, not just for us, but for almost every industry. But finding caregivers that are committed, that are willing to stay, that are willing to do the physical work, the emotional work that goes in caring for our seniors has become challenging because it's also a low paying job. We do background checks. It's a requirement. That's not an option. We have to fingerprint our staff and run criminal background checks before we can even employ them. A few years ago, we put in a system where we do the fingerprints. It's a great system, but it delays our hiring process. And many times we lose good applicants because they're offered jobs elsewhere for the same amount of money without going through the same level of scrutiny. Then there's the maltreatment cases. And you referenced OHFC. OHFC is at times our partners. However, when we have an issue of maltreatment, neglect, or abuse, oftentimes the provider has investigated, retrained, terminated, disciplined that employee before the state has even responded to the complaint. When that happens, especially if we terminate employment, that employee can go down the street and get another job working for another senior living facility. And it could be six months, two years, three years before anything is done with the complaint. That is not acceptable. So recognizing the challenges of what we are dealing with, we have a lot of providers that have a lot of best practices that we implement in our organizations because there are many of us that say, this is not gonna happen under my watch. That is a fear that many administrators have, is that one of these stories will happen in our facility, and what can we do to make sure it doesn't? There is everything from hiring practices, orientation and training. There is constant ongoing training. The state and federal regulations, for many of us, are a minimum requirement. They're not the maximum requirement. Many of us go above and beyond what is required in the name of the law. We have quality improvement. And again, there are requirements in the state laws as well as the federal laws for what we are supposed to do related to quality improvement. But many providers, including myself, go well above and beyond this, doing quality improvement meetings weekly, monthly, including our floor staff, including our medical directors, including our residents through the processes. We implement mentors. Mentors are so critical in our training processes that's not a requirement. We go above and beyond because we want to train people using the best caregivers we have to train new people coming in. Um, the governor's task force has a lot of recommendations. And I will not tell you that all of them are bad. I won't. Um, they are, they're, they're, those recommendations are meant to protect our seniors, which is something we all want to do. But that task force left out very important stakeholders of the process. <coughs> we have providers who have implemented best practices in their organizations that did not get to sit at the table and share how those could be implemented in a broader context. And those ideas did not even get considered. And those ideas are working for thousands of residents in Minnesota. 
This bill, House File 3308, allows these providers, as well as our state agencies, our ombudsman, OHFC, the Department of Health, to be a part of the table and be a part of the solution to look at what best practices, what consumer recommendations will and won't work, and how we can collaborate together. Because the goal is to take care of the people we are serving, which is our seniors. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. All right. Um, I think we'd like to move to amendments. Uh, there's several DFL amendments. Um, <coughs> Sorry. All right. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to testify on this bill? All right. Uh, if you do, uh, please uh, talk to the pages. We do have uh, several listed testifiers who signed up. We'll go to the list first, but if you, uh, if you would like to testify, uh, we can do that as well. Uh, Joan Wilshire will, is the first up, followed by Josh Berg, then uh, Mary Jo George. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Wilshire. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good evening. Yes, um, my name is Joan Wilshire. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Council on Disability. For the last 45 years, um, our agency, my agency has been advising the governor, state legislature, and state agencies and the public um, on disability issues and on accessibility issues as well. And I want to thank Representative Keel for uh, recognizing the importance of including the perspective of people with disabilities in the assisted living work groups. Assisted living is one housing option and not only for elders but for people with disabilities too. I would also like to point out that one in three adults over age 65 have a disability. The council is the only state agency with an accessibility specialist on staff and an important piece of ensuring that safety of all assisted living residents is making sure the physical settings and building design of these facilities are fully accessible to everyone. So we want to thank you again, Representative Keel, for listening to us on this point. But I think it's critical that establishing assisted living licensure is a part of this legislation. These working groups need to focus on the details of how assisted living licensure would work, not if they should be licensed. It's time for us to um, start working on this problem we all know exists and to commit to a real change in how Minnesota protects its elderly and people with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilshire, for your testimony. Next up, we have Josh Berg. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Josh Berg. I'm the Director of Services for Accessible Space, Inc. Um, I just simply wanted to reiterate uh, what uh, Joan had said about um, inclusion of individuals with disabilities uh, as part of the working groups. I think it is uh, massively important. Um, ASI, Accessible Space, we provide assisted living services to individuals with disabilities, brain injuries, mobility impairments across Minnesota in 16 assisted living uh, properties. Um, so it, it is important and it will impact um, thousands of individuals, uh, you know, all these language changes. Um, and I, I just want to point out some of the things with some of the possible amendments that are going to be brought forth. Um, and and Representative, Representative Schultz, Liebling, Murphy, and Allen, you guys all have sites uh, of ASI in your districts. Representative Murphy came out and visited one of ours. Um, so keep that in mind as we, we bring forth these amendments or if these amendments are proposed. Um, and you said it with an earlier bill with House File 118 that you don't want to cause harm. One of these amendments, um, I think it was the big one, A3 amendment, will cause harm uh, for some individuals if this is uh, put forth and if this is included um, specifically with the AL licensure piece. Uh, if we try to rush this, it will cause individuals with disabilities um, uh, choices to be made. Uh, they will not be able to live in the places that they are currently uh, living or they won't be able to receive the services that they're currently uh, receiving. So. I encourage you to slow down the process, let these working groups do their job. Um, this is a very complex system, and it is one that if we bring all of these 
uh, groups together. You know, I'm sitting back here with, with Jean and Kay and those from Elder Voice. We can do this together and we can have good discussions. We can agree to disagree and we can bring this discussion to a good spot, but it can't happen so quickly. Um, so I encourage you to to go with what Representative Keel's got here. Let's, let's work through the process. Let's do it right and thoughtful. Um, because there are so many issues with, with some of these amendments, whether it's the interested person stuff, the electronic surveillance that needs to be vetted and talked about so much more, um, and so many other things. So thank you for including individuals with disabilities uh, in, in the discussion. Um, and trust, I think, that we're going to work through this. Uh, I myself as a provider with Leading Age and, and others, along with the advocates, AARP and others, we'll, we'll get through this. So. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mary Jo George. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Mary Jo George with AERP, and I'm here on behalf of the um, Elder Abuse C Consumer Coalition, which includes the Alzheimer's Association, Elder Voice Family Advocates, Legal Aid, and Minnesota, the Minnesota Elder Justice Center. Joining me also are family members who will share their stories of abuse and neglect. First, I just want to start by saying, you know, thank you, Representative Keel, for holding hearings on our consumer recommendation, uh, recommendations and our bill in your aging committee. Unfortunately, we're here to say that we want Representative Keel and lawmakers to do more. As we reviewed House File 330, 3308, we have concluded that it fails to make the necessary changes to both our civil and criminal laws to prevent elder abuse and to hold abusers accountable. While there are some modest changes, we do think the bill must be strengthened. For example, the bill does nothing to provide protections against arbitrary discharges deceptive marketing practices, or protections against retaliation. And tonight you're going to hear from families who have suffered without these rights. These rights are particularly important <coughs> given the marketplace today for senior living that bifurcates the home care from the housing services. We believe this is resulting in many housing providers to overpromise what they can deliver to older vulnerable adults. Moreover, as Representative Keel has indicated, the population living today in assisted living set facilities are very vulnerable. 39% have dementia. Significant numbers of people need help with daily activities for living. We think we need some discharge protections. We do fortunately provide discharge protections for vulnerable adults in group homes today. We do for nursing homes. So why not for our elderly population and for people with disabilities in these facilities? While the bill amends the grievance section by saying people can exercise their rights, there is, at, there is no meaningful way to enforce them in this bill. Lastly, we are concerned that the Task Force on Assisted Living only considers whether or not we need new regulations and dementia care standards. We think the question is not if we should regulate, but how we should regulate these facilities in order to create safe standards for care. We are an outlier. We are the only state in the nation that does not have public oversight of these facilities. And our neighbors in Wisconsin and North Dakota and Iowa all do. So again, tonight we're here to urge lawmakers to do more. And thank you for the, the steps that you have taken, but it doesn't go far enough. And at this point, I'll hand it over to Chris. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. George. Uh, Ms. Sundberg, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and sure. thank give you us very your testimony. Much. 
Thank you, Chair Dean and, and members. I'm Chris Sundberg. I'm president of Elder Voice Family Advocates, and uh, we are a nonprofit volunteer organization uh, composed of primarily of family members and other stakeholders who have had horrific experiences <coughs> with their loved ones being abused at senior living, home care, and long-term care facilities throughout the state. We ask that you strengthen this bill as Mary Jo has just outlined. The abuse of elders and vulnerable adults is far from rare. It is epidemic. The reports of complaints are escalating at an alarming rate, rising from 4,000 in 2010 to over 24,000 last year. They are coming from nearly every county in the state at a current rate of 400 per week. This is rising because the long-term care industry is broken. I hope that you have had time to review the copy of the investigation reports from our, uh, your respective areas. Uh, they were dropped off on Monday. And uh, perhaps you feel like we did. We were shocked when we reviewed a lot of this information. Residents have suffered long, painful deaths or had limbs amputated because of untreated infections, ignored emergency conditions, or the failure to give basic care. Additionally, many are malnourished because they are not being fed enough nutritious food or given the necessary assistance to even eat that food. Others report sexual assaults by other residents and occasionally by staff. There are also many instances of broken bones, bruises, festering sores, and abrasions that are a result of physical abuse, mishandling, and neglect. In other cases, residents have been left for many hours without being moved, fed, given water, or even kept clean. Cruel treatment is often reported, such as hitting, insulting, belittling, scaring, and many other humiliations. In my case, my father's body laid in his room for seven days without the facility doing a wellness check. We were told, however, that they would do so if he didn't show up for a meal. Well, obviously, they failed miserably. Not only did he miss his meals, the newspapers were piling up outside his door, and a neighbor across the hall said, please check on him. I haven't seen him. Two of the residents came to uh, my son uh, as we were cleaning out his apartment, which, by the way, we had to have a hazmat team come in to take care of things before we could even enter. And, and most things, anything of any kind of fabric had to be destroyed. But anyway, these two residents came and they told him, we're afraid. And I'm sorry, nobody should be afraid to live in their senior living facilities. I believe this might not have happened to my dad if there had been licensure with clear standards and a prohibition on deceptive marketing. Please do not let the senior living care industry continue to do business as usual. Business as usual will only result in more suffering and premature painful deaths. And I do want to end by saying there are excellent providers and I thank them, we all thank them, but the bad ones are really bad. You are the only ones who have the power to make the systemic changes that will end this suffering. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we have Mr. Lynn. Welcome to the committee. Please give us your testimony. Mr. Chair and committee. Uh, yep. Good evening. My name is Eric Lynn. Uh, just to share my story, my, my mother, Irene, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's at the age of 58. Mom passed away last year in April at age 65. Uh, thank you for listening to our story, which has been nothing short of a nightmare. Mom was a caregiver herself, working as a nurse's aide for over 20 years. 
After diagnosis in 2009, she lost her job, her privileges to drive, her home, and her dog. Yet when it came time for her to be cared for, we discovered that the facilities where she would live and the staff who worked there had little understanding of her needs as a person living with Alzheimer's. They promised us quality care but failed to provide basic care. They ensured us they had proper security measures but she was able to leave unattended. Eventually she found herself discharged and rejected from several places. I asked myself, how did our family get here? You make the very difficult decision to move your mother to an assisted living or what you think is a memory care facility. Your belief is that a care facility is surely licensed and has professional caregivers that have been well trained. After all, this is what the brochure states. This is what the website shows. You finally convince yourself and family to visit a facility. You're greeted by the manager and shown a beautiful leather couch and a stone fireplace. The promise of a home cooked meal, relaxing bath time, and an overall wonderful experience. But what is the reality? Five months into mom's stay at the first facility, she wandered away. She crossed a major county road before being discovered by a vigilant neighbor. This traumatic experience led to a 10 day hospital stay where an untreated urinary tract infection was found. Then the facility stated they would not readmit mom and cancel our housing agreement. We were given 24 hours to take mom home or find another facility. We had no appeal rights and no real plan to help her safely transition to the next facility. We found another memory care unit, but the incompetent care was just too difficult to accept and we, we her family, provided the basic care that the facility was unable to provide going, going into the facility. The third facility under competent, compassionate RN gave us hope. Mom's condition improved and she actually rebounded. But three months later, that RN was chewed up by an administrator who cared about filling beds and charging for everything possible. We were right back to daily challenges, lack of leadership, and mom's condition would soon show the effects. In her dying days under, hosp under a hospice care plan, the facility failed to communicate and follow the plan. We were forced to take mom to my home to die and assure dignity under our watch. Every dollar our mother worked for and saved went to three facilities. She paid to be neglected over and over again. We became accustomed to hearing, if you don't like it, get out. If you cause problems, we will evict you. A kick the can solution is not enough. Families like ours can't wait another day, much less a year or two or five, for more groups to talk about the problem. We need solutions today. I'm asking you for my mother pro who, uh, to prohibit misleading advertising and promise to protect them from being kicked out of their homes commit to a license structure that would have protected my mom and made sense to us as her family caregivers who wanted to do the best for her. So thank you for your time today. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Lynch. Uh, Ms. Winchell? Yes. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is actually Suzanne Scheller. I have the privilege of reading testimony from Barb Winchell who was here earlier in the day but could not make it back this evening. My name is Barb Winchell. At age 90, my mother was admitted to an assisted living memory care for services related to advanced dementia. The decision to admit her was particularly difficult for my 90-year-old father and my family. The assisted living was chosen after representatives from the assisted living facility had assessed mom at her home and stated that it could meet her needs. We became concerned about several lapses in care that placed mom at risk and communicated those to the assisted living administrators. For example, the footrests often take, were often taken off her wheelchair, but when, uh, it, but when being transported, the footrest should have been on her chair to prevent her feet from dragging and abruptly stopping the wheelchair, creating a fall risk. Often the staff was in a hurry and neglected to be watchful of moms dragging her feet or did not take the time to add the footrest to prevent her feet from dragging. On two different occasions, mom was projected out of her wheelchair to the floor while being transported by staff. Both incidents resulted in trips to the ER for significant facial and head trauma, skin tears, and hospital stays for a concussion. In meeting with the administrator staff, we expressed our concerns. We were told that the fall was mother's fault because she dragged her feet. The facility did not change her care plan or otherwise intervene to reduce her risk of falling. We filed a maltreatment report with the Minnesota Department of Health about the falls. Within approximately 60 days of filing the complaint, we received a letter of termination of home care services, stating generally that the home care provider could not meet my mother's needs. The letter did not state what needs could no longer be met, 
My mother had no assessed change in condition. Our family asked for a meeting with the home care provider to attempt to work out a solution. At the meeting, the home care provider communicated again, no change in condition to warrant an increased level of care or discharge. We stated that we would bring in nursing services of our own as allowed in their contract and as an option to assist with care. However, the landlord spoke up at the meeting and stated we were not welcome. So now my mother who had advanced dementia had to be reorientated to a new living arrangement. We were concerned about the effects of moving on her and on my father who would have to drive a greater distance. We ended up moving my mother to another assisted living. At the new facility, she did not have a fall and she entered in at a recommended level two service package compared to the level four at the previous facility. My mother experienced retaliation in the form of an arbitrary discharge. Had there been even the most basic protections in place, her discharge could have been addressed. There were no limits as to when they could discharge my mother. They did not even tell us why they couldn't provide services any longer. There was no way to appeal the termination, which could have allowed at minimum extra time to find a new suitable location. 30 days is not enough to find a new place with advanced dementia. We had no assistance in finding the new place. The landlord said we could not bring in our own service. So we, we had no power to stop the <coughs> arbitrary termination. We had no options. We urge you to strengthen provisions for residents in House File 3308. Assisting, assisted living needs to be licensed. Termination of services and housing must be appealable. Retaliation is alive and well, and it must be stopped. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Patty Sager, welcome to the committee. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Patty Sager. Thank you for hearing my testimony today. My father, Dennis, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's over 10 years ago. We knew finding the right care setting for him might be a challenge, but we never imagined having to encounter so many broken promises. In less than three years, we have had to move my dad into and out of three different memory care facilities. Along the way, he's had six stays in hospitals and transitional care facilities. When we started the process, we spent a very long time before deciding on a small assisted living memory care setting that was supposed to be his forever home. Unfortunately, our trust with this facility was irreparably broken when he was transported and left unattended in a local hospital for over 12 hours. They never even alerted our family he was there. As we looked for a new home for my dad, we thought we were being more careful. We settled on a beautiful new place, promising 24-hour on-duty nursing care and a nationally recognized memory care training program required for all employees. But we soon learned that the staff members were not actually receiving the nationally recognized memory care training. We have encountered many exceptional caregivers, those who are always the first to fill in when someone else missed a shift. But we also saw firsthand, and we continue to see firsthand, that those long hours worked and mul multiple shifts lead to burnout. My dad and his fellow residents suffer as a result of this. At the second facility, I met with the facility leaders and two regional directors to discuss our concerns. My reports fell on deaf ears. Instead, we were subjected to retaliation, and the facility began misrepresenting my father's behavior and actual care needs. I sensed they were trying to force my dad out. Shortly after Thanksgiving in two, of 2017, my father suffered a stroke and went to the hospital for a short recovery. Even though we had been assured that they would be able to care for my dad up until his death, the facility would not allow him to come back home to his memory care unit because he couldn't feed himself. After his stay in the hospital, it was another broken promise. We were left with no option but to move all of his belongings out of this facility that very day. After spending 60 days in transitional care, we moved my dad to his third memory care facility. I am hopeful and I'm really an op a eternal optimist. I, I really hope that the voices of these family members will 
have an impact on all of you and that they will be heard and not overshadowed. We, we call on you and urge you and pray that you will adopt the structural recommendations made by the Consumer Work Group Coalition. I don't want to see any other family suffer through sleepless nights and emotional turmoil, struggle with the same problems our family has suffered. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Sager. Next up, we have uh, Sheila Van Pelt. Welcome to the committee. Hello, Chairman Dean, members of the committee. My name is Sheila Van Pelt. Um, throughout the course of the day, it's come to be what I had as written testimony. I'm, I'm changing up a bit. Um, first off, I first came to the legislature in 2012 for events that happened to my mother. I had a concurrent investigations done, one with, um, well, both with the Minnesota Department of Health within the Health Regulations Division, a facility investigation and an HMO investigation. And uh, both were wrought with problems and still with major problems, even with an HMO one that we aren't even discussing. What I have seen in these investigations is falsified data that gets through the cracks. And um, there's a dark story here. But before I get to that, I just want to say with the working groups, to add to the working groups, um, when it comes to the citizens portion of it, or a family member to be involved in the three working groups, I'd like to see that we have an established voice there. We have care providers noted in leading age. And then I, I really do look at back at what ARP has, Elder Voice, they've, they've shown that they are established, an incredible group. And I hope that they, or between one of them, are recognized to be a member to set on all in these working groups. So we have their voices of people who are not only just living in these facilities, but who have lived and have suffered, but who can bring that real human voice. Because Elder Voice, um, they're not paid to do it. They're doing this because they're gathering so many people to make Voices of people who have, again, no voice, maybe not the right word, but they're making them alive and they're credible. So I hope that they will be considered to your working group. Um, what I just want to make sure is know that I volunteer in a nursing home every Friday. I see a lot of different sides. I see wonderful caregivers. And then I see things that, that aren't so great. And my point um, is, Representative Liebling, when you said we need to put teeth into some of these different things, we already have teeth in what our penalties are for people who falsify data or retaliation. And believe me, I have been retaliated by both the HMO at a tune of $6,000, $7,000 a day, various things. The facility, I want, they wouldn't even let me buy medical records. Needless to say, I have a no trespassing notice given against me. Police are involved. But then I'm telling them, listen to the tape recording I have with the administrator. OK, but the point is, my recommendation has been to the state for a long time when it gets back to tainted data, OK? Right the other day in the paper, uh, state faults Egan Senior Home after resident found dead in room. Again, like Christine Sundberg's uh, father, papers are outside. But the records say that they did their well check, OK? And then my particular situation, I see what was provided to the state falsified records. I was there to see the event unfold. Health partners, for instance, I'm going to use that name. The HMO, a part of this, um, gave me a gift of saying for 1,361 pages I received, they were signed and notarized as a full set of records. And they were not. And it's only because I invested over a thousand plus dollars and getting documents everywhere. I have the missing documents that they don't even have. That they didn't even report to the state. So that's a, they come into these facilities, and they're immune from all of this. But then you've got provider groups who are, you know, God willing, all of them want to do a good job. But then also for the great providers out there, what happens when something goes wrong? What are they going to provide in their medical records? What are they going to provide to the investigator? And are we even going to care? And in my particular case, I fought this so hard, I went up to the Maltreatment Review Board and only find out the state of Minnesota investigated the wrong facility. All my rights were taken away, but they were proud. And I've used this word before. It's like the Wizard of Oz. You've got this big, booming voice coming out to you saying, I'm the wizard. Dorothy goes out, and they do everything they're supposed to do, do everything right, and they come back. And then the curtains opened up, and it's just a person behind there. Okay. 
I have come to the state in good faith, showing facts and data through the years. 2013, before I even met with the governor's office, I understood communications were being transcended to the governor's office about me, and I was being watched. I requested meet with Governor Dayton in 2013 because of a chair of a committee who said you should meet the, the legislative auditor, Mr. Noble, Commissioner Ellinger, and then um, Governor Dayton. I never thought I was worthy of it, but I did, and I pushed on, and I'm glad I did. But what I found out is I was, Governor Dayton won't meet with me, didn't meet with me, but his Health and Human Services Policy Advisor met with me. I've asked for the state to investigate the MDH because they aren't checking out and, and doing their job in ways that they should. And I will tell you this, 2016, Lauren Gilchrist, former Health and Human Services Policy Advisor to Governor Dayton, told me that Governor Dayton's aware of my issues and we're working on them. These are systemic issues and issues of wrongdoing in the state and known to this, the OHFC and the governor as a whole, all the way up. Nothing has been done but to contain me, in my words, of facts and data that get at the heart of systemic issues and wrongdoing that are known. And these working groups are great, they are wonderful. But make sure you have families in there that are going to give it to you straight. Because I see enough dancing around the issue. Um, I, I go to the, the finance board and I see all the lobbyists there are for the two provider groups that are major here. And all the influence and all the unspoken things that are done. But there are people out there who are suffering and at the MDH knew this was going on and contained it. To what, preserve a reputation? I, I've seen enough, I've seen the dark side. And there are people here who have seen the dark side with the facilities, with the provider groups, but I've seen it within our own state government. And I'm going to say this, you know, I'm being well from the bottom of my heart, but we are cutting down the messages of what have we put out there. People are suffering, and what are we doing to protect them? And I just urge you, when these working groups come together, look out for the people who are really suffering. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Van Pelt. Uh, Ms. Alice Albert. Last on the list. All right. Uh, were there other folks uh, from the uh, audience who <coughs> signed up to testify with the pages? Or anyone else who would like to testify on the bill? All right, seeing none, uh, let's go to close off the public testimony portion of the bill and open it up for uh, member questions and comments. Members, Representative Loeffler. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Keel. Um, you started out your, your presentation by saying this is complicated. And um, I think there's, it's complicated only because there's such a long list of things for us to do that have been identified. And um, I must say, uh, and then you said that the most important thing is for the office, the healthcare facility, to do its job. And I totally disagree. The most important thing for us to do is to immediately do all that we can as policy leaders and law writers to stop the abuse, the maltreatment, and the retaliation that's taking place and making people afraid to even identify problems for fear that they're gonna get kicked out with 24 hours notice. And um, there's been a lot of work done. It started with the Star Tribune articles that I think made a lot of us go, whoa, um, what's going on? But then it was followed by a 58-page report done um, when the governor created the task force, invited everyone around the table to look at this and identify the issues and come forward with some really strong recommendations, followed by a 122-page legislative auditor report. So we have over 200 pages of assessment of the issue and strong suggestions on how to move forward, proven pass forward adopted and proven in other states. We're the only state that doesn't regulate our assisted living, housing with services industry. We can't pretend we have to start with ground zero and convene a task force. We need to step up to stop what's going on. 
We should be ashamed, all of us, and I include myself in that, that we went from 4,000 reports or allegations of maltreatment and abuse in the year 2010 to over 24,000 in 2017. That's a shocking rate of increase, and we have responsibility to make sure that our people are safe in facilities that we pay a lot of money for out of taxpayer dollars. They pay tremendous amounts out of their lifetime savings. And they, more importantly, trust their happiness and the quality of their life and their ability to thrive to those caregivers. And they're counting on us as the supervisors and the guiders of this system to be making sure that that is a tr system worthy of trust and worthy of the care of the most precious thing that you can have, which is your quality of life. That's what we all want, no matter what we're suffering from in life, no matter what our disabilities are, whether we're, we have an unknown number of years and months ahead of us or we know it's less than two. Two months. You want those two months to count, and you don't want them to be fearful and to be afraid of neglect, and that no one will check in on you for seven days. That's amazing when these people are paying thousands of dollars a month for this care. The 24,100 reports a year that we have now established as a baseline is 66 reports a day. 66 people a day are being reported. Who knows how many aren't being reported? You know, the word's out, nothing much happens. But 66 people a day have someone who steps up and says, this person we think is being abused or maltreated or neglected, and their care needs are not being met. I think we have a responsibility as policymakers and overseers of the system to step up. That means that since I got here this morning, for my first committee meeting at 8.15, that five people have endured the kinds of things that we heard about today. Five people. Five families are going, what the heck is going on? What can we do? And if we say something, will we be kicked out? This bill doesn't do anything about the retaliation. That should be, I mean, nobody should be afraid to say, I don't think grandma's getting her medications. It, I don't think she's getting turned. The bed sores are getting worse. I don't think he's getting sufficient nutrition because he is losing weight rapidly. What is going on? That's five people since I started my day. We need to have a sense of urgency about this. Um, this this, at the rate that I've seen in these reports, um, 88,000 people a year are served by our senior and assisted living and housing with services facilities. At the reported rate, if they were spread equally, and they may not, you may have some bad apples that get lots and lots of reports, because I know there are good facilities out there with good caring people. But if it was spread evenly, your chances are less than one in three that you are gonna be have a report of neglect or abuse or maltreatment filed against you um, or about your care. Less than one in three. That is just not acceptable. These people deserve to have their care needs met. They need to deserve to have a sense of urgency. Not only is there no protection against retaliation, which is a real threat when someone can kick you out in 24 hours notice, um, that's a scary sort of thing when you're vulnerable and you're dependent upon others. And not everyone has caring family like the witnesses that we've heard from. Or their family may be working in California and rural Iowa and they can't only come up here on weekends so they may not catch everything. Not everyone, some people outlive their family. I had an aunt of my husband's who lived to 110 and a half. And bless her soul, she had a pretty good run. She didn't have many problems till she was 110. And that last half year, I think she was ready. Um, but you know, that's not the situation for lots of people. And not only do we not make progress, but we actually have lessened the protections. And I'm just gonna call out one thing on section two of this bill. 
which is correction orders. Okay, this is when we have decided something is wrong. It has been substantiated. It has been investigated. And what do we do on line 2.16? We used to say that the department should specify the time allowed for correction, which for some of these offenses should be like by five o'clock tonight. Some of these things need immediate attention. But do we keep even the authority of the Department of Health to order, specify the time? No, they're just supposed to make a recommendation. And then they get to wait for a corrective action plan. And then they have to, within 15 days, decide if the correction plan is adequate. Does that convey a sense of urgency to you? This bill is just embarrassing, given the amount of data that we have the documentation that we have, and the models that we have from other states, we could be doing something real. And instead, this bill proposes that for the next nine months, we convene some tax forces. And during that nine, nine months, if the current rate continues, 18,075 reports of neglect, maltreatment, and abuse will be, be received. Now, we know not all of them will be substantiated. But that is a shameful legacy for what we will accomplish over the next 19 months or nine months. And I am really disappointed to not see a bill here um, that has a sense of urgency. And I'm not on the other committees that heard this, but so this is my first hearing and I am so disappointed that I as a policymaker do not have a substantive bill that will starting in June, as soon as we're done, <coughs> change the situation for the 88,000 people who will be getting care from others in an industry that I want them to trust and that I want them to feel comfortable with. And I want every person who works in this industry to feel respected and trusted and cared for and, and feeling like they are in a profession they can be proud of. But we need, we've got a lot of work to do, and I'm sorry, I don't see the urgency here. I'm, I'm really disappointed to see that all of that work, all 200 pages of serious analysis, examination of models that have worked elsewhere, is being watered down to some task forces. Representative Liebling. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair and Representative Keel, we heard some pretty compelling stories here tonight from some folks about what happened to their loved ones in, in some of these facilities. And first of all, I want to thank them for hanging around. It's now 10 minutes after 11, if anybody's watching a tape or, or God help them watching us live stream um, or listening later. No, they're sleeping. Either. But uh, so people have hung around a long time. And of course, this isn't the first hearing. And, um, and the bill has a way to go. But Representative Keel, we heard some really compelling stuff, and frankly, it, it makes a person kind of feel sick to sit and listen to some of the stories and to read some of the accounts of what's happened to some of these people's loved ones, and I, I know you feel that way too, and um, of course, we all sit here and think that could be my loved one, or it could be me. It could be any of us. We're all headed there. We're all headed there one way or another, and you know, you can have an accident and you can need the care sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. So this is something that should concern every single Minnesotan in a very personal way. And so I just wanted to ask you, you we heard some stories about some pretty bad stuff. For example, we heard some stories about retaliation. We heard about some deceptive marketing. We heard about unfair discharges, number of them. Suddenly, you find that your loved one doesn't have a place to go back to. So I want to ask you, what does your bill do to help the person who's experiencing those problems? Representative Keel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, first of all, and I probably should have written some of the data down already, <coughs> if you go back into our laws already, uh, some of this is already required. If you're a vulnerable adult, you're required to uh, be served. And, and there is retaliation law there. Maybe we need to make it a little tougher, but that is, that is an existence. Um, uh, 
the uh, correction orders that you commented on, uh, Representative Loeffler, were uh, those are for the commissioner to address. But the OHFC has to respond in 30 minutes. Uh, the uh, facility has two hours to to um, uh, uh, report uh, the infraction, whatever it is, uh, if it's serious or not. And they, they, part of the reason we have the numbers we have are because they are reporting everything. And that makes it hard for the OHFC to get through the, the weeds of what is serious and what is not. Um, but uh, in my research of talking to facilities, uh, reading the uh, reports, um, the OHFC was not responding in a very rap rapid manner and uh, nursing homes are going to have to, well, not just nursing homes, this is housing with services. Um, uh, they were not um, reporting back to the person who um, uh, reported. There was no way to know if the report was heard, addressed, um, were they investigating, those things the OHFC um, has to address. And I, and I believe that um, we may need to look into some ways of requiring them to respond right away. To not, maybe not right away, but to let the reporter know uh, soon after that uh, there has been a, uh, it, the uh, claim is in process so that people know that they've been heard. Um, uh, we have to look at some privacy issues there. Uh, the challenge is that when I talk to not just providers, but I actually talked to some residents recently um, while we were on break and uh, <laughs> one elderly lady said to me, well, what if I don't want my kids to know what's going on? Why, I don't want them to know, even if it was something serious. Well, you know, sometimes our family isn't stable and doesn't understand they should report or families should know what's going on so that they can handle it. Um, that becomes a difficult position uh, to let somebody know what's going on. It, they have privacy is what I'm saying. And, um, you know, there, this is a work in progress, Representative Liebling. Uh, it is, like I said, it's, it's not difficult because it isn't been addressed. There is, we have quite a bit of law. Um, unfortunately, we have not um, uh, required and met those, those laws that are already required, that we haven't addressed those. And that's, there's another bill tomorrow in uh, public safety on some of the uh, civil, uh, or the criminal issues, so that part of the bill, so. So, Mr. Chair, I may. So, Representative Keel, it sounds like your position is that we don't need to change Minnesota's law other than making sure the OHFC can enforce those laws. And, you know, I think a lot of people in this room would strongly, strongly disagree with that position. You know, I think the reality is that this bill that you've brought doesn't have any protection against retaliation. It doesn't have any protection against deceptive marketing, and it doesn't have any protection against unfair discharges, and a lot of other things, too, that have been identified. So the reality is, Representative Keel, and not, you know, you, you've, um, obviously this is a, an issue that has some meaning to you, and it should have some meaning to all of us, but we're hearing the wrong bill. I think that's really clear. Your bill is not the bill we should be starting with. There's another bill that, um, and it is 3468, House Files 3468, which contains the work of the consumers, the people that were here testifying, AARP, and the other groups that have put a lot of time into this, Alzheimer's Association, Elder Voice, um, Minnesota Elder Justice Center, people that are representing con the consumer voice, the people that are experiencing these terrible things in some of the facilities. And, you know, I do want to say, like you've said, like Representative Loeffler said, we understand that there are people also doing good work. We don't want to brush everybody with the same brush. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean 
that we should fail to give needed protection against the, the facilities or the caregivers or just even the random times when people are not fulfilling their responsibilities because these are extremely vulnerable people. And we owe it to them to put in place the protections, at least the level of protections that other states have. I mean, it's really shocking that Minnesota is the only state without real public oversight of these facilities. That, that's really a shocking thing. We're used to being the leaders. So we are hearing the wrong bill. And so when I hear people like Mr. Berg came to the table and said, oh, there are things in the, the amendment that aren't right. Well, the amendment, one of the amendments that could have been offered tonight is the complete other bill, the bill that's the product the work product of all the folks that I mentioned. That's the bill we should be working off of. It doesn't mean it's a perfect bill. No bill is perfect when it starts out, but we should be working off of that bill and then hearing in detail in the committee process about what needs to be changed and amending that bill if certain things are left out, just like you're doing a little bit of amending of your bill. So it's not your bill versus perfect, but it's, it's a bill that has actual, the work product of the consumer representing the consumer voice as the starting point. And it's really disappointing. And it should be disappointing to consumers, to, to seniors and their families and people with disabilities all over this state that we're not starting from the point of view that we need to be offering maximum protection and safety. And then we could be hearing from the voices of the industry about what they feel doesn't work, what goes too far, and so on. And then there could be a process where we could amend that bill. And it's just really disappointing to start with your bill, which, you know, I, not from any lack of interest on your part, I know. And I, you know, it's certainly not a personal, um, you know, I know that you are approaching this with all goodwill. But it is really disappointing, not just to me and not just to colleagues on this side of the table, but to a lot of people in this room and a lot of people in this state that this is where, where we're going instead of the real work we should be doing. Thanks. Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, too, want to thank the testifiers for coming forward. I do realize that we've got people, as some of my colleagues have mentioned, we've got uh, some good players out there. We've got some issues out there. You know, when I hear the numbers uh, that were well gone over by Representative Loeffler of over 24,000, that to me is a crisis that demands action, that demands speed. Uh, and a work group is not going to get a speed. And I'm not saying that the work group is not needed. I think that's something that can be looked at as we're going forward. But it's, I'm echoing what Representative Liebling was coming off of, is we need to have actions going into place now. I think one of the uh, things that disturbed me most as I was listening to the testimony was the amount of retaliation that's going out there. And I know that the bill that was being referred to, 3468, has a whole section being put in for consumer protection and on addressing the subject of retaliation. I think that is a bill that we should be able to have being heard and brought forward before the session is over. We cannot wait another year and have another almost 24,000 cases come forward. And I, while that they may not all be proved, I think there's a lot of truth that there could be an understatement in that number when you start realizing that retaliation and the, these type of efforts that are not counted right now, we've got probably cases that are not being reported. So it's a significant number that cannot afford to wait. Uh, and I take a look at a, a little bit from a personal side. Uh, within the last few months, my parents have gone into assisted living. My mother has Alzheimer's. Uh, you know, when you take a look at the numbers that maybe one in three may be subject to it, I have concerns. The facility may seem okay right now, but there are occasionally flags that come up. And when I hear the lack of protections out there, I'm worried about my, about my folks in that facility. And I, as, as I take a look at not only for my folks, but the other seniors that are out there and the other vulnerable adults out there, we cannot afford to wait. We need to get the other bill going. We need to get it heard so we can get action on it. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Fisher. Uh, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
I just I want to make sure we're really clear on this. So uh, AARP, an organization that has such credibility on this issue that the testifier for the industry actually cited AARP uh, in the point about Minnesota being number one or number two was an AARP study. AARP, Alzheimer's Association, Elder Voice Family Advocates, and these other groups have said very clearly that uh, this bill will do very little to protect vulnerable adults, which is our goal. No protections against unfair discharges, the other points made. It says has no teeth. It does virtually nothing to strengthen or expand the rights of older Minnesotans living in care facilities. <coughs> what I'm considering, the steps that we need to take to uh, protect older Minnesotans living in care facilities, I'm going to be looking to the ARP of Minnesota and these other groups. Um, I will be much less likely to look to, um, I, we heard from the industry on the one side, I haven't heard much else beyond that. I too do not doubt at all um, Representative Keel's intentions here and her goodwill. Um, uh, but this bill, uh, according to the people who have expertise, who we all look to, to help us make the decision to protect our elders, they are saying that this bill does not do it and it does not address the epidemic. I don't know about the rest of you, but I got this long list of allegations um, uh, about care facilities in, our, in my district and our districts put together by Elder Voice Family Advocates painstakingly. I'm going to be looking to them to decide what we should do. This bill does virtually nothing. This should not move forward. We should move forward on a bill that actually will do something. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, Representative Murphy. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And um, Representative Keel, for the testifiers that um, came and testified about their uh, loved ones. Did all of those happen? Uh, all of those cases happen in Minnesota? Representative Keel. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm Representative Murphy. I believe so. Yes. So they were all Minnesota experiences, <coughs> all Minnesotans who mm -hmm. were injured or perished in, <coughs> in facilities here in Minnesota? That's my understanding. And that when, Mr. Chair and Representative Keel, when did the, when was that, so it was the last summer the story came out. Is that correct? Representative Keel. Uh, the uh, news releases were in November of 2017. Yeah, thank you. And Mr. Chair and Representative Keel, what is the timeline for the, the bill that we have in front of us? So if this becomes law and the work groups are convened, um, what is the next step after the work groups are convened? Representative Keel. Mr. Chair and, and uh, Representative Murphy, my intent is, um, or the intent of the bill is to have those decisions made that need to be handled, hopefully by January when the new legislature uh, convenes so that those, uh, those uh, licensure that um, the uh, other, other issues that need to be addressed are uh, the, the um, legislature is looking at it in January, end of January. So uh, my intent would be that by uh, by 2018 things, or 2000, this is 18, isn't it? Um, 2019, that um, the legislature has in place uh, a licensure for uh, assisted living, housing with services, uh, some direction for those facilities uh, so that they're able to, uh, it, 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 it was needed, according to the OLA, it, it is needed in many fronts. The OHFC needs the licensure more clear. Uh, assisted livings, housing with services, they're making comments that uh, there needs to be a, a, a clear direction. And uh, I think that will help us to recognize where we should put our family members or where our family members should make that choice also. And thank you, and uh, Mr. Chair, so if I understand that, um, just in the rough math, it'll be a couple of years um, of work before we put into place um, meaningful law change uh, with regard to elder abuse in the state of Minnesota. Representative Keel. Um, if if a, if uh, someone is waiting, waits that long. But what I'm hearing, in fact, when I was at my local nursing home this last week, they have already told me uh, what they're planning on doing, and. Uh, uh, they're addressing some of this already, whatever they can. Part of the challenge is the uh, facilities have asked uh, the uh, uh, MDH to also for recommendations when they when they make reports. You know what's happening. What what should we be addressing? What are the statistics? Um, they weren't seeing or hearing any of that either. 
So it was hard for them to read what needed to be done in some cases. And in some cases, um, I don't know if we have testifiers here today, but um, part of the problem is, is that they did make uh, changes. But um, uh, probably because of human error uh, or laws weren't defined enough so that they could arrest somebody or not put them back in the service, we're seeing staff go from place to place. And that's, that's really serious. And um, we need to be able to identify that and, and, uh, and handle that. Uh, making sure that somebody who's committed a crime, uh, especially, is addressed right away, uh, as soon as we can. Um, and thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Keel. Uh, you know, a long time ago, a long, long time ago, I worked on the Vulnerable Adult Act, and um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I have to imagine that uh, given what we know um, from the news stories, from the OLA report, uh, from the testimony that we've heard, that uh, we should be, act, be able to act more quickly than 24 months um, in bringing relief for uh, our cherished elders uh, and the care that they're receiving in care facilities. And I, I heard uh, the testimony from um, uh, the woman that joined you at the start of this hearing um, and her frustration that um, there were some that were excluded from the governor's task force um, and, and arguing that we should <clears throat> um, move forward with another group of studies because we want to make sure that those voices are heard. Um, and this legislative uh, process is really about voices being heard. So we, we could have been moving on the consumer-oriented bill and then incorporated the concerns and voices of the industry um, and come out of the session with something that would have brought relief. And I, I just you know think that 24 months is a very, very long time. And I understand this is complicated, like most things that come before us. But when I think about another significant uh, incident in Minnesota and our response when we think about the collapse of the 35W bridge which happened in mm -hmm. August and by September of the next year that bridge was replaced there had been an act of Congress there had been an act of the legislature um, an override uh, there had been an act of this legislature and funding and a, built was, a bridge was built, a big bridge was rebuilt because Minnesotans said that should not happen, that bridge should not collapse. And I know that Minnesotans are deeply disturbed by what they read uh, about what's happening in care facilities across the state of Minnesota. And those stories and what we heard tonight weren't more than study. It requires action. And we should be able to act more quickly than 24 months. Um, and so I hope that you will take into consideration the work that was done by that task force. And we start to bring actual relief and not just study. We've only got six weeks left. All right, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in the medical field, uh, medical providers take it the Hippocratic oath to do no harm, to provide the best care to the best of their ability. The patients and as elected officials I think it is our duty and our job to um, do the best we can not to harm people living in Minnesota to help people in Minnesota and by not bringing forward the bill that was worked on by all of the groups that are advocating for um, patients and for loved ones that we are doing harm by not taking action as soon as possible. And I think that a bill that was produced from the task force needs to come to committee and get right to the floor so we can start addressing the problem that people are being harmed in our state. And any delay is our responsibility. And so I seriously, I would hope you would reconsider and work with your Republican Senate colleagues because their, their bills are doing a lot more than this bill. And if we do nothing or we delay, we are responsible for the harm that's being done to people in Minnesota. 
All right. Uh, other member comments? Final comment, Representative Keel. Um, I thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Um, I wanted to point out, uh, we talked earlier about retaliation. It is in the bill. It's on page 18 and 19. Some of it is existing language. Um, most of it is, but uh, there's some added uh, references there. Um, there is, uh, I guess, I know we need to get going. This is we're tired and, and this has been long. But I, I I want to impress on everybody who bothered that is staying and taking the time. And for members that don't know me very well, um, and I talk a lot, so you probably all have heard this. But um, for me, this is personally important. I have spent uh, my life taking care of people. Um, I don't believe that we're worse than other states. Um, I have been shopping in other states for people to reside in nursing homes. Um, I distinctly remember walking into one and my husband said, uh, we're going, we're not even talking. It was so pathetic and we were helping to find a place for his aunt. Um, she was wealthy enough, we flew her home to Minnesota. That was her choice um, in a private jet. Um, and uh, um, we were able to give her the quality of care in Minnesota that she deserved and uh, we knew when we brought her home, she would have less than a year to live. Um, but that's not the only one. I've had experiences with assisted livings. Um, my aunt last year died in March. She fell out of bed three months before. There was some major problems with what happened. She's handicapped, she's mentally handicapped. She uh, had all kinds of challenges. Um, lived in a nursing home for 20 years, which is very unusual these days. Memory care toward the end. Um, and I think this is an urgent issue. But I also know from my experiences that if we are not very careful <coughs> with what we do to make sure that we are providing the best care for everyone and giving the guidance to the facilities that are going to care for them, that there are going to be some problems and we are going to lose some facilities. I had people, I was in a funeral uh, last week and I had more than one nurse, uh, granted they're getting closer to retirement, but they came to me and they said, Deb, no more, I quit. I put in my notice. I won't stand for any more. Um, I work hard, I, I dedicate extra time and um, they said they were really frustrated and I know they do really well, good work, but I also know they're on this report that I got from Elder Voice. And in fact, they told me about some of these reports. Unsubstantiated, I find it ironic that I saw it in here, um, but shared with me a couple of them. And they were reports that, and I don't want to minimize anything that has happened to anybody, but there were some unsubstantiated reports that they lost, the, legis the uh, resident lost something their personal item and they looked everywhere for it and after two hours they had to call and report it. so they did and after they reported it the next day guess what they found it so they called back and they said you can take that off the report we found it oh no it's part of the report that's the way it works so of those 24,000 reports which are horrendous by any means to have that many reports we certainly need to close down the reports, um, get, get, uh, lower them. Um, we, uh, we have to understand that there's a lot of reporting done here that isn't the tragic stories we're hearing. And so we have to get down to making sure we're taking care of the individuals that are in facilities. And you also need to remember, I asked the department, we don't have that number yet, but um, this, this can be people that have services at home. This can be uh, challenges between family members. This can be um, challenges between residents within uh, housing with services. Um, there's, there's all kinds of reports that are made. So I, that's why I asked them, what is the breakdown? What, what is the details? Um, but we certainly need to do as much as we can as soon as possible. With that, Mr. Chair, I would ask for support of this bill. Thanks, I'll renew 
Uh, the motion that 3455 as amend or 3308 as amended is laid over. Uh, thank you, Representative Keel, for the work on the bill and also for your good work uh, in the committee. Thank you.